fewer and fewer people decide to visit my poor old self. <laughs> oh. we just say M is a metric space, but what it means is that we are just given some non-empty set and we are given a function from, well this function takes two points in M and produces a non-negative real number and what does this function satisfy? Well, the distance between X and Y is only equal to zero as long as X and Y are the same point. Okay, that's one condition for the function. The second condition for the function is that the distance from x to y should be the same as the distance from y to x. And to impose a bit of geometry, we use the triangle inequality, right? So that the distance between two points, between the point x and y, is no longer than if I take a point somewhere in between in its itinerary which is why this is called the, the triangle inequality okay so this is another condition we impose on our function usually the hardest to check so then knowing that we just explored very easy ways of just just creating new metrics out of existing ones so one procedure i call internal method and that's because what you do is you take a metric and all you do is you modify the input into that metric so what it means in generality is that if I have a function from m into n all this function has to do is be one to one okay and we happen to know that n raw is a metric space then I can create a metric on m as follows the distance on the two points from x, uh, from x to y in M is the same as the distance of the image of those points. Okay? So here is an example of how that might work. So suppose that you take M to be equal to the interval from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And F, the function, will just be tangent. Right? So tangent is injective, in fact, also onto, but let's just say it's injected, that's all that matters in this case, uh, from this interval into R. Okay? And then we, well, I can define a metric on this space to be absolute value of tangent x minus tangent y. I just took the raw function, that was the absolute value function, and I just modified the inputs. Okay? I just send the inputs to the image space and I measure the distance in the image space. So that's, this makes sense. I see some eyes tell me no, but uh, let me see. Let me see. Some eyes try to not betray anything, poker faces, <laughs> but some eyes definitely do this, so no. The only thing that's confusing is, shouldn't it be that if n is a metric space, then we can define a metric space in n? No, uh, there is no assumption that m is a metric space. It could be any set. And I uh, can de define a metric on the space M by virtue of this procedure. Because uh, the, the points, what in essence happens is that when you inject, you say that those points are lying inside of a, of a space that you understand how to measure distances. Okay? So there is, it seems not, not really important to, maybe you don't see the importance of doing it for minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, it already has a natural metric. It has the absolute value metric. I can measure the distance between two points, and that will be the absolute value. Okay? Um, but let's say if I create this type of uh, metric on it, notice that if I included minus pi over 2 and pi over 2, the distance between them, you might think, is what? Zero, which can't be. 
No, well, you, you can say, uh, no, it's not zero. In fact, uh, this is minus infinity and minus power two, and this is infinity, so the distance between those two points is infinite. By the metric space that I described, the distance between those two points is infinite. In other words, what you can do is you can create, this is, in essence, this tangent function, what it does is, in essence, tell us that I can take all the real number line and I can compress, right? The minus power two and power two are the infinities. I can just compress them into my script. So what I do with the tangent, I just, uh, the distances as viewed from outside this universe are shrinking as, the, as I get towards power 2 or towards minus power 2, right? So in essence, what I have accomplished, let me just draw it here. What I have accomplished, you, you, instead of just, uh, so the way I see this uh, space, it's something like this. So this is power 2, this is minus power 2, so maybe this is 0. And then the distances, let's say this is one distance, this is a distance to the left, and then they just get, you see, the distances get compressed, so to speak. What I did in a way is just squeezed the entire number line, compressed it together like a spring, and within, for a creature living in this space, each distance between two notches is maybe one unit, right? But just to you, the one units, they look uh, smaller and smaller. So that, 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 that accomplishes some sort of compression of the space. Uh, the example where that is used uh, very frequently, that's compactification of the complex plane. What, what you do is you take this infinite two-dimensional plane and you project it onto a silver ball, a mirror ball. And uh, that is what I call the anna german metric, but more formally known as the Hordel metric. Okay? I, I'm, I'm going to show you the video. I already posted the video and, and gave you the link. Unfortunately, so terribly sad that you don't speak Russian and you only see one phrase that I could translate, why, why, why I think of the sphere, right? One, one phrase there is uh, beyond the mortal sphere, which is again not mortal, but bad word. But, but again, it does feel like the people float out away from each other at a distance that is forever, and yet they meet at infinity. Or don't. Right. That's just a poetic way of saying I will never forget you. I will never see you. <laughs> That's another song, by the way, right? It's called Yunona Ya Voice. Beautiful song, but so lost me. Okay? We understand, right? So this, you understand why I call it the internal method? That's because, really, I modify the distance in the inside. Right? I modify the inputs, and that's how I create a new metric function. Then there is a slightly more complicated procedure. I call it the external method. And what you do is you take a, positive, you take a function uh, from 0 to infinity to 0 to infinity. Its graph roughly looks like the root function. Right? It basically looks like a, like a metal stick that is bending. Okay? And what I mean by, um, formally what I mean by that is well, first of all, the function is, is 0 only at 0. Uh, the function has a positive derivative. You can see that the slope is positive. Right? And uh, the derivative is a decreasing function. In other words, the derivative, you see here it's steep, here it's less steep. The derivative is becoming less and less positive. So you can say maybe the second derivative is negative if it exists, or the first derivative is just becoming less positive. That's kind of the weaker conditions that I, that I impose. And uh, if this is true, we verified that, uh, we verified last lecture that I can then modify a distance function. So if I have m and it has a distance function d on it, I can then uh, plug that distance into the function uh, g, and now I created another metric. That's why anyway, it's external because notice I don't modify the inputs into the distance function, I just apply g after I measure the distance. Okay? In a way, you can see what, what sort of uh, relationship it will have to the distance. In general, actually, I don't want to say too much. In some places, it might stretch the distance, but as you go to infinity, you can see that it compresses distances. Like over here, distance will be compressed. Okay? But in here, maybe near zero, the distance might be stretched. Maybe even a lot. So uh, some examples, uh, and those are useful examples, uh, once you consider once you consider, let's say, uh, infinite dimensional um, spaces, we're going to consider norms. So 
here is an example. So suppose I take this function, x divided by 1 plus x. You can verify it satisfies those conditions. You can kind of graph it. It will be a curve that, uh, uh, that, that, ha that satisfies the conditions I mentioned. And then uh, what you have is you take the absolute value function and apply this function to it. And you get this, which right away, by this, by this idea right away, this will be a metric space. I don't need to verify. When you verify all the machinery, this will be a metric space. Now, if you use this metric space on R, for example, notice that the number is never bigger than 1. So what you can do is you can, you can compress the space R. We already did it once. Yeah. We did something similar once. You can compress the metric, the full distance R to something that always has finite distance. The biggest distance this could be, notice, right? The biggest distance this could be is maybe one unit, right? You see that this is always less than one. So two points are no more than one unit away from each other, okay? So when you study topology, uh, you consider all sorts of metrics. Sometimes it's convenient to have a metric that is bounded. So the distances don't grow too much. Uh, okay, so those are the procedures. Those are some of the examples. So let's see if you understand something about metrics. So I take this as an attempted metric on R. So its absolute value of 3x minus y will this possibly work as a metric on R. Why? Why not? Yes, please? Uh, if, no, and like, because it wouldn't satisfy the second condition that if you switch Wonderful. Right away, it's not symmetric. You see? So if this were a metric, then you would find something rather odd. You find that you go one way, and the distance is, let's say, one number, but the other direction, the distance might be bigger. Distance going backwards is bigger than distance going forward. And that's a rather strange. So this is not considered a metric. No, because no symmetry. And by symmetry, I mean uh, condition 2 is not satisfied. Make sense? You see, just switch x and y. I will have 3y minus x. That would, and then if you want to, you can plug numbers if it still doesn't convince you. The symmetry is violated. It cannot be a metric. Again, when you say a metric, be very careful. You always have to consider the, not only the function, but the space. Right? If we only have one point, well, even actually if we have uh, one point, if you, if you plug one point, it's not going to be zero. Notice, if I, if I only have one point, unless that one point is considered to be zero, it's not going to be, the distance between one point in itself doesn't have to be zero. One way, another way, you, know, you get my point. Good. So, how about this weird, ugly looking function? Will it be a metric? Think about it for a moment and tell. Right? So this uses. Well, could it be a metric? Yes. Yes. Why? Because it satisfies the three conditions. If you plug in, um, if x is equal to y, then we have ln of one, which is. Um, which is zero. Then we have, um, if we switch x and y, it doesn't make a difference, it's the same function. Okay, so those things, uh, one and two, are the easy ones. Okay. Usually the hard one is property three. Well, ln in general looks like a, uh, looks like that. that right, way. right. So you, you see I can strip it, right? So this looks like I, I don't want to write it uh, entirely, but you see what I did. I, I, first of all, I began with a regular metric, let's say this is uh, x minus y, and I modified it by process uh, 1, I modified it into x cubed minus y cubed. Uh, so I modified it by the internal method, okay? So this preserves metrics, right? <laughs> then uh, the next uh, process is I modify it by the external method, so next it's just going to be x cubed minus uh, y cubed over 1 plus x cubed minus y cubed. And that's by the external method uh, and using this type of function. 
Okay? And then I modified it by the external method once more by the type by, by just applying the eleven. Right? And then I just again use two and I apply uh, ln uh, plus one. Okay? Ln will look like that, the plus one only just is used so that it, at, at zero it will be zero. Okay? So ln plus one will, will be a curve that looks like that. If I ignore the negative part. Okay? So this is just uh, produced by repeatedly using uh, the internal and external method and that uh, trivially creates it creates a metric. Good? So, now hopefully you have a sense of it. Let's talk about an important class of metric spaces which are called normed vector spaces. So norm vector spaces means that uh, what we have is we have now a space V, which is a linear space or vector space. So this is a space in the sense of linear algebra. Do you remember what the space of linear algebra is like? No. No? You took linear algebra before this class. It's a prerequisite. So linear space is, uh, is really your naive notion of what is the algebra of space, right? So for example, one naive notion is that I can select a direction and I can move in that direction indefinitely. So I can take a vector and I can uh, add it to itself as many times as I'd like or multiply it by any, let's say if it's a real valued space, I can multiply it by any real number. And that means just stretching the vector, compressing it, switching the direction backwards. That still keeps me in that space. Right? You see the point, right? So, so here I start at zero in the vector space, I select the direction, and I just stretch the direction to arrive at any other point. And if I have two directions, I can first move by one direction, stop. Where I stop, it's the same homogeneous situation. It looks like at the starting point, and I can then move, let's say, in the other direction. That's vector addition. Vector addiction is also good. You should be addicted to linear algebra. <laughs> it's really, I was when I was young. <laughs> was my favorite subject at some point. Right? So you have this, uh, this algebraic notion of space from linear algebra, and on top of that algebraic notion, you now impose notion of distance. Right? Simplest vector spaces you can think of are R2 or R3. Right? Which, which are, so, so, so V is a linear space, and uh, we, have, uh, we have the following function. We have this function that I denote by two bars. And this is a function from V to 0 infinity. And this is going to be measuring the length of the vector function. Okay? So it has to satisfy the following properties. One property that I have already listed it out here. The fact that I say that the, that the codomain cannot be below zero and cannot be infinite, that just says that, uh, that the size, the norm of the vector v is bigger or equal to zero and less than infinity for all v that you find in the vector space v. That's one condition. Second condition is that the only time you have a vector equal to zero, its size equal to zero, sorry, is when the vector itself is zero. So that means that the norm of V is zero if and only if V itself is zero. Right? Third condition is if I multiply by any scholar, by any scholar, sorry. So that means that if I take alpha times v, that's supposed to equal to the absolute value of alpha times the norm of v. Eventually, it's really annoying to write the double bars. You just, you just use absolute value, and you know by context 
what that means. It could be the size of the vector or it could be the size of the number, right? So that would be uh, for all v in the vector space and uh, for all alphas belonging to the field. And the field is usually either equal to R or to maybe the complex field. But it could be a finite field if you study abstract algebra, right? Field is just, there could be finite fields, there could be other types, but a field is, I didn't really go over it much, but uh, it's, it's a little bit richer structure than the vector space. All right, so, and then of course, another property that we must always have is triangle inequality. in this context means the following. So what I have is if I take the norm of V plus W, that's less than or equal to the norm of V plus the norm of W. And that's obviously for all V, W, in v. And why is it also called triangle inequality? Well, how do you add vectors naively from, from calc 3 lectures? Right? So what you do is you have here is your v, here is your w. Right? So then what is v plus w? v plus w is the vector connecting your initial position to the position where you go. That is v plus w, and you can see that uh, the sum of the lengths of v and w should be bigger than v plus w, unless of course they are collinear, right? In in uh, in two-dimensional space, you see that when is it gonna uh, not be a strict inequality? That's when it's when they are collinear. We can actually investigate that this is true purely purely using uh, the definition of the Euclidean distance, which I'm going to specify soon, okay? That one person has this ability to vanish without me ever noticing, you know? <laughs> he has this complicated property, right? Complex property of maybe he's imaginary, maybe he's real. So, Let's, uh, let's look at, uh, at some examples. Uh, so, uh, actually, before I mention examples, how does this allow us to create a distance, right? So, with, with this, I, I can say that V, V is a metric space where where how do I measure the distance between two points? If I take the points V and W, if I want to measure the distance between the vectors V and W, that is simply the same as the norm of V minus W. So I use the norm to measure, uh, to measure distances. Okay? So let's look at examples. Example A, we have the absolute value function, and this defines a norm better known as the modulus function. It defines a norm on R. Okay, and then this is the norms. B. So 
n-dimensional real valued space, uh, each of the following defined norm. This, uh, of this vector, please. Eight. What is it? Eight, right? Oh, you take that, yeah, eight, sorry. Eight. Yeah, so what you do is you take the absolute value of the first coordinate plus the absolute value of the next coordinate plus the absolute value of the last coordinate, you add it up, and you get eight. Okay? Now, let's calculate the Two norm. What is the two norm? What do you do? So you take the absolute value of the first coordinate and what do you do with it? Square it plus the absolute value of the middle coordinate, square it plus the absolute value of the last coordinate, square it and take the square root. What do we get? Uh, so we get root of 9 plus 25, which is root of 36, 34. which is 34. 34. 
What? Therefore, it's 34, not 36. Same oh. Of 34. Root of 34, sorry. Wonderful. All right, so, sorry, I, I actually see glitched. I wanted it to be a good number. <laughs> sorry, here we go. Right? So, so, but ended up not having a good number. Too bad. <laughs> Thank you for being so lenient. So, what is the x infinity norm? What is that? What is the infinity norm? So that would be just the maximum, uh, it would be the maximum of the sets absolute value of minus 3, absolute value of 0, and absolute value of 5, uh, which is which is just uh, 5. Okay? Notice uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see how the relationship goes. Professor. Yep. Um, in um, in linear algebra, I recall taking a vector and trying to make its magnitude one. Yes. Trying to make it into a unit vector, and for some reason, I remember that being called a norm. Does that norm have anything to do? No. This is this is called normalized vector, right? So uh, so or unit vector. So when you take a vector. Uh, you can make it a unit vector by dividing it by its magnitude. By normalizing it. Yeah, okay. so it's normalizing. The it's norm is just the measurement of length. Okay? So, what should I say about, about uh, the example B? So, we have B. So, you see, you will find out that it is not terribly difficult to verify that the one norm is a norm. It's not terribly difficult to verify that the infinity norm is a norm. The harder one is the two norm. Okay? It involves the most work of the ones I presented. As it happens, there, there is also, they see, there is a two. What's so special about one, two? In fact, what you can do is you can take any p bigger than or equal to one and less than infinity and define the p norm. So this example, you get it, uh, that's the calculation, so uh, I should say that, that in general we can define P norm. Or P being a number bigger than or equal to 1 and less than infinity, I can define the P norm and can you guess what the P norm is going to do? It's going to add up all the components of what? From 1 to n of xk to what power? P. P. And take 1 over P. Okay? And this gives you a hint about what the infinity norm, right? What happens is that if you push limit where p goes to infinity, you will arrive uh, from, maybe starting from this norm, you will get all the way to this norm, okay? The infinity will be what happens if you push p to infinity. It will end up being the maximum of the numbers here. You can try calculating and see if you see. So it's an exercise in calculus. Do it maybe with R2, then it's pretty clear that it's the same for R3, etc. Um, so another thing, uh, so th those are just, uh, I'm going to talk about the quiet at length. Right now, I mean, you, you just, I'm just claiming there are norms. I haven't done any verifications. But uh, let me mention just another, another very, very similar and important example for, for norms. Uh, that we would be on the spaces of functions, function spaces. So example C. So you should know that uh, C, A, B, this is space of all continuous functions. Functions F from the closed interval A, B into, let's say, in our case, into R, it could be into C, right? So those are all the continuous functions from A, B into R. That's the notation. 
and we have the following norm. So we, we, we have, uh, so for a function, we can take the one norm. So the one norm of the function f will be uh, given by the integral from a to b of the absolute value of the function. If you think about why, what's the integral? This symbol is for summation. So if you do a Riemann sum, you see that this is very similar to the one norm here. Right? If you integrate, what are you doing? You're adding a bunch of uh, components. Right? So if you break the interval from A to B into n parts, this will look like adding the absolute values of n chunks, which is very similar to what you have here. Hopefully I make myself a little, well, understandable. Oh, I see some eyes glancing, so no. So two norm. The two norm, what is the two norm? It's going to be the integral from a to b of absolute value f of x squared dx to the power one half. And, well, I can just say that in general the p norm, that will be the integral from a to b of absolute value fx to the power of p dx to the power of 1 over p. Okay? And the infinity norm will be very similar to the maximum, you can in fact use maximum. Every continuous function on a closed interval has a maximum. We will see that fact later. Um, that's but but uh, well, you can say that this will be the supremum of all the x belonging to the interval a, b. And the supremum is of the absolute value of the function f of x. And that is the same as maximum because this function will have a maximum. In this case, supremum and maximum are the same. Don't worry, this I haven't justified. Okay, so that's example C. Now let's consider example D. I'll keep it a little bit for now. So, example D. So if I'm given a norm vector space, and W is a linear subspace, So in other words, it defines a norm by restriction. If this function is good to measure the length of vectors in V, certainly it's good to measure the length of vectors on any subset. Okay? But in this case, since we're dealing with vector spaces, we need to require it to be, it has to be a subspace. All right, so now a little bit uh, scary part, I will, I will be careful here, right? So you're not really happy with R to the N, you will be less happy with R to the infinity, in other words, uh, infinite Cartesian products of R with itself, countable infinite Cartesian products. So uh, we might consider the 
so we, we basically can consider the following, right? So, so E. E. So, so we can think of R infinity. This to be the collection x1, x2, x3, etc. So this really is a collection of all real valued sequences. If you think about ordered, uh, an ordered list of of real numbers, you can think of it as just a sequence, right? So this is space of all real valued sequences. So then, if you think about the space of all real valued sequences, you have to be careful about uh, which norms uh, might, uh, might work. So for example, uh, notice that if I use, let's say, this norm, if I use the one norm, right, then um, uh, if I use, it's not going to always work. So what do I mean by not always working? Well, let's take the harmonic sequence. So let's suppose that x is equal to 1, 1 half, 1 third, one quarter, etc. So this is the harmonic sequence. Thank you. This is the harmonic sequence. And if I try to take the one norm, I will be required to add all those numbers. The one norm ends up being one plus one half plus one third plus one quarter. And this is adding up to infinity, but the size of a vector is not supposed to be infinite, okay? So this does not work on, uh, on our infinity, but we can define L sub 1 to be the sequences for which this works. So define, I now should maybe, maybe say maybe, but if I now use the 2 norm, notice if I use the 2 norm on this, on this vector, then I am squaring those numbers, right? The 2 norm is uh, this is going to be 1 squared plus 1 half squared plus 1 third squared plus 1 quarter squared to the power 1 half, right? Now, uh, this is, if you remember from calculus, this is a convergent P-series, right? It's convergent. In fact, its value, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, pi squared divided by 6. There is, a, there is a very cool elementary argument for that that you can see on 3 blue and brown. I can show you the link. Very cool elementary uh, way of doing it. But from calculus 2, you remember maybe that this uh, sum is finite, right? So this would be pi squared over 6 to the 1 half, which is less than infinity. So the 2 norm works, the 1 norm does not work for that same point, okay? So then we can try to make the following definition. We can try to break the sequences into smaller spaces on which one norm works, two norm works, three norm works, etc. We want to see on which, uh, which of the norms are going to work. So uh, this again, is a, maybe it's going to be lost on a few of you, but uh, try to see if you follow. That's, so, so we define L sub P to be a subset of R infinity and that's for P bigger than or equal to 1 plus than infinity and uh, L sub P is defined as follows so basically uh, L sub P is equal to the subset X belonging to R infinity such that the P norm 
of this x will be less than infinity. Okay? So in particular, the harmonic sequence that I gave you, it's not in L1, but it is in L2. Okay? If I use uh, the 2 norm, I get a finite size for the vector. If I use the 1 norm, I don't. So L sub p is just going to be gathering the sequences for which uh, this uh, norm is measuring a finite length for the vector. Okay? And uh, you would see the following relationship. So you would see that, uh, notice, or don't, uh, if p is less than q, then you can say that LP is going to be contained in LQ. Okay? Now, why am I? Why is that true? Very simply, I notice that this, this this is an infinite sum. If an infinite sum is to converge, its tail has to go to zero, right? So, so basically, the, the first bunch of elements they are not really changing whether the sum is infinite or, or not. It really the tail of this infinite series, what matters, right? So, so if the numbers are going to be eventually smaller than one, right? So if, if it works for, for p, then the p power is going to be smaller than one, and therefore the q power is going to be even smaller than the p power. So the tail, the sum of the tail is eventually smaller than, uh, you know, for, for q it's eventually smaller than for p. Again, I waved my hands, you didn't get it, all right, we'll return back to it, okay? If you get it, wonderful, you remember calc 2. Okay, that's going to be one condition, uh, and uh, the L infinity is just the, the space of bounded sequences. L infinity is the biggest of all the LP spaces, and this is just uh, the space of bounded sequences. Again, because what does the L infinity, what does the infinity norm do? So the infinity norm of X is simply the supremum uh, over all the k's. So k is starting from 1 and to infinity of Xk. Right? So if, for example, the infinity norm for this X, right? If X is 1, 1 half, 1 third, what's the infinity norm for this one? Can you see it? What's the infinity norm? for the vector I'm pointing at, harmonic sequence. What is that? One. one. Because what I do is I just look at all the terms, I take the absolute value, and I see what's the supremum. You see, it could not necessarily have a maximum, right? Some sequences, they increase. Let's say, so the sequence um, one, uh, uh, what is it, the, the sequence uh, one half, uh, uh, Three quarters, you know, that, that sequence, it's increasing, but it never reaches one, yet its supremum is going to be one. Okay, so you don't necessarily have a maximum, but you might uh, see that there is going to be an upper bound to the sequence, and that's going to be what this measures. Okay? Alright, so, a bunch of things I just mentioned, and yet not verified, I said that those uh, are norms on Rn, and I said that they are norms uh, for some subcollection. And in fact, I implicitly stated that Lp is a vector space. It's not easy to verify for a general p, but we will try to to do that, right? Well, maybe I'll just I'll see. I'll, I mean, I'm a bit scared of the Lp when we first introduced to it, so maybe I'll stick to finite dimensional spaces. We'll see. I'll look at your eyes. All right, so let's try to verify the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, right? That's the first step to, oh, no. right, you remember Cauchy-Schwartz, right? Very important inequality. No. No? What were you doing in linear algebra? <laughs> we were at some All right. So... I'm going to go easy, I'll do it for Rn, okay? And then uh, in my notes I have it for L, L2. So, so, let's verify that the 
find the north. Yeah. On, let's say, our n, but really more interesting on L2. Okay, L2. Actually, I have to be careful not to go too easy because I, have, I just remembered that uh, completions are, are done using the L spaces, right? So the, you can make every metric space complete. It's going to be later. So maybe I, I want you to know something about the these spaces. All right, so, so first of all, we have this lemma. It's known as Cauchy-Schwarz. So what is this stating? It's stating that if x and y are elements of Rn, and really maybe you should think of elements of L2, then the dot product Y, that's called the dot product, and all it is, it's actually going to be slightly stronger than the dot product, it's going to be uh, the summation of xk absolute value, yk absolute value, k from 1 to n. Okay, so I used absolute value, so it's slightly stronger than dot product. Do you remember dot product from previous courses? Yes? So then this thing is yes, I can't be sure that I that I am using the same. No, in my notes I did keep it as a dot product. Okay, so this is just let's call this regular dot product. And then the absolute value of the dot product which is the absolute value of this quantity, they are the same, is, oh, it's clearly less than or equal by the triangle inequality in R, then the summation and this will be less than or equal to the size of x in the 2 norm times the size of y in the 2 norm. Okay? So first let me give you an intuitive uh, explanation why this is true, so you remember. So if, I, if n is equal to 2, if n is equal to 2 then, uh, then what is x and y? Here is So only part of the force is the useful part of the force, and that's what the dot product is measuring, right? So the dot product of x and y is going to measure the following. So, so between the x and y, you know in R2 the existence of the angle theta, okay? So what is the dot product? The dot product is simply the part of the force y wasted is ignored. Okay, that part is not doing anything, and the part of the force that actually uh, moves the, the particle along the along along x is this. Okay. So the dot product of x and y. 
simply the magnitude of x, the two magnitude, that's the whole measure of a prisoner two, times the magnitude y times cosine of the angle between them. Right? The size of this vector is just cosine of the magnitude uh, of uh, of yes of y times x. Right. So this defines um, this defines the dot product. You remember that? No. Right. Why did why did the dot dot product become useful? Well, a dot product is what measures work. If you have work is distance times uh, magnitude of the distance times the magnitude of the useful force. The useful force is this blue line, and uh, the, the distance is the magnitude of x, right? So the dot product is defined as the magnitude of x times the magnitude of y times cosine of the angle between them. Okay? So this, this thing ends up being, you can verify uh, if you want to, if you if you talk to me, I can show you, or what I should call three lecture I have, uh, I can show you that this is going to give you in R2 the same definition as what you know as, uh, as this, this summation. It's going to be just multiply the components and then the computer, okay? So if you know that this is the way uh, the dot product is defined, right, this, is, this is equivalent, this is equivalent to, now n is 2, so it's equivalent to having x1, x2, dot product y1, y2, which in other words, this is, this is going to be equivalent to x1, y1, plus x2, y2. Okay, this ends up being the same, but in this form, the Cauchy inequality becomes trivial, because if you take the magnitude of x, of the dot product of x and y, this is then uh, the same thing as the magnitude of x measured in norm 2, uh, magnitude of y measured in norm 2, times the absolute value of cosine of the angle between them. But cosine is always smaller than 1, so this is less than or equal to magnitude x times magnitude y. Okay? So in R2, in, intuitively that's why this, this was not. In R3 you can still imagine an angle between vectors. Once you get to higher dimensions, it's a little bit difficult. Is there an angle or not? I don't quite see. So then what you do is uh, you, and also for, for this, this inequality is true in many uh, circumstances that don't involve um, Rn. So we, we modify the proof to work for any n. So now let's let's prove it. Prove. So observe that if I take the norm of x plus t times y, this is the same as If I take this norm squared, it's the same thing as taking the dot product of x plus t times y with itself. And here, for any t that is a real number. Now, if you think about what this means, right? This only means this only means what you see in, the, in this absolute value. I just take the components here and I take their product and then distribute. So this will be the same as x dot product x. times t 
times the dot product of x and y plus t squared times the dot product of y with itself. Are you with me, right? So the dot product is just, well, the only reason this happens is because of simple multiplication. If you have, uh, uh, if you have R3, I just rearrange, rearrange the terms, okay? You, you, you just let me be sure. You see why, right? So, so what, is, what is this? This, uh, so, so what, I, what you have is, it, why is this? Because uh, x plus, plus ty, It's just the summation of xk plus dyk dotted uh, multiplied by xk plus dyk. So if I then rearrange the sum, I just get what you see on the top. This quantity is bigger than or equal to zero. This is bigger than or equal to zero. Correct? For any t. Because, again, I, I take numbers and I multiply them by themselves, so I add up non-negative numbers, so I cannot, get, I cannot get something less than zero. Yes? So this, so this is a quadratic equation, right? This is a number. This is a number, and we, we see that it's a quadratic equation in T. So, so what I see here is quadratic equation in T. And how do you solve a quadratic equation? So what does it mean that this quadratic, sorry, this quadratic inequality is bigger than zero? So that means that if I label, remember the, the quadratic, if I label this part as A, this part, right, so this part together with the two as B, and this as C. So the only way I don't get zero is that the quantity in the root, in the formula of the quadratic equation underneath the root, the discriminant I think it's called, is um, non-positive, right? So the consequence of this is that, is that, uh, is that uh, B squared minus 4AC has to be less than or equal to zero. That's the implication. Do you see that? B squared. So if I have a quadratic equation, if I have a, a, a parabola that is above the x-axis, that means there are no zeros. Or maybe if it's touching the x-axis, there is one zero. So that means that in the quadratic equation, that's what I have underneath the root. This number cannot be anything other than zero because if it's positive, I have two solutions. If it's zero, I have one solution. Okay, so it's less than or equal to zero. Now, what is that in terms of our quantities? So uh, that is what is b squared? B squared is so b squared is four x y absolute value squared minus Minus what? Minus 4 times A, which is YY, times C, which is XX. Okay? So what we have is, and this quantity is less than or equal to 0. So what do we have? 
we can divide by 4, we have that absolute value of the dot product of x and y, inner product x, y, uh, minus, this is just uh, magnitude y squared times magnitude x squared. This is less than or equal to 0. Then moving uh, things across and taking the square root, I get cauchy schwartz inequality. I get that the magnitude of xy is less than or equal to the magnitude of the, the, ma of the size of x times the magnitude of the size of y. the proof as long as you notice that uh, it does and I can take the absolute value of the components that doesn't change the argument what one way whatsoever okay? it doesn't change the argument at all since show this, uh, but this quantity, let's call this quantity, so this is quantity 1, but 1 is bigger than or equal to the inner product of absolute value x1, absolute value x2, 2xn, with the corresponding absolute value of y1. And so on. If I replace the absolute value by absolute values, this is not going to change the inequality. So I feel, in a way, that I just talk to myself into my nose. You just want to, to see, do you, do, you, do you follow this argument, right? I assume that you are kind of comfortable with dot product, so I kind of did this fast, right? If you understood dot product, how it works, then the, the argument hopefully makes sense to you. Why is, why is 1 greater than or equal to the dot product of the absolute value? Shouldn't it always be equal to? Uh, 1 is this quantity, the inequality. 1 is the... So, this is the definition of the dot product. You get it? Shake your hand for yes if you understood this from Calc 3 or whatever whenever you're supposed to learn this. Yes? Okay. Shake it strongly <laughs> so I can see that you understand it. <laughs> like a lizard. Okay, uh, so if you don't shake your head, uh, you can talk to me. I'll try to help you with it. Okay? So this is uh, how the dot product was motivated. It had to do with, uh, with considering the, the physical notion of work. That's, it's, that's, that's how it's defined for R2 or R3. 
and it ends up being this quantity. Okay? Now, because we're dealing with higher dimensional spaces, and because this proof is more general than just what you see with, with angles here, right? It, it, is, it works for, let's say, the norm with, with functions. It can take the dot product of functions, which involves integrals. Yet the functions are not right away, they don't look like straight arrows in a way. So uh, an argument of this form works for all real valued vector spaces. Okay? And the argument here is just using the idea that you see, I, I, just, I just take the norm of, uh, of a vector with itself, squared, that's the same as the dot product of the vector with itself. Okay? And then you can use uh, the properties of the dot product to break it apart, and you get a quadratic equation, and this quadratic equation cannot have uh, more than one solution. So that implies that the discriminant is less than zero, and that then implies the cauchy schwarz inequality. Not all lost. Not all hope is lost. I will end torturing you now. <laughs>